So this morning, Easter service at Freedom Fellowship. Um, yeah, I'm trying to set up so people can see at home. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of scriptures. Did I tell you guys to turn to Romans 6 already? No, we're going to be hanging in there a little bit. We've been going through as a church family here, the book of Genesis and Romans. So every other week we're in one of those books. This morning we're taking a little bit of a break. Um, and I'm really excited. I only have three pages of notes and I normally have anywhere from 14 to 17. So we're really excited for this. That doesn't mean the sermon is going to be short. I'll give you a heads up <laughs> on that beforehand. Uh, but we're going to spend a little time in Romans 6 because as I've been reading ahead in preparation for the next few chapters, so much of the resurrection reality uh, comes to this morning. Um, so I'm not going to change at home sorry guys hopefully you can see them on the tvs up here uh we should pray that god would bless uh our time in his word so father one thing we do know and what you've declared when it comes to the bible your word um it's alive <laughs> it's powerful some of us didn't get that until we got saved lord it just seemed like any other book sounded like a bunch of good stories Father, but when you crashed into our life, Jesus, our eyes were opened. Lord, truly, this is what we need. Lord, we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. I would pray for every single person here this morning or those who are uh, watching at home, Father, that you would uh, just open up our hearts to receive what you would have this morning. God, that you give us ears to hear. We thank you for the narrative of the Easter story, uh, but we thank you that it's actual uh, reality. Father, it is an account. Uh, even informed scholars of the day don't even want to argue whether or not you rose from the dead, Father, because it means the facts are there. It means they're going to have to deal with their creator. Uh, but we want to be mindful of you. We want to be mindful of the reality of the resurrection this morning. So I pray, Father, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word today, but we'd be able to hear, to receive by faith, and then uh, just allow you to change our lives, that we would actually do something uh, with it for your glory, Jesus, we ask. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what does Easter reality actually equal? Okay, It's a resurrection reality. So what does that mean for us? Okay. How many of you guys have been to more than 10 Easter services in your lifetime? Okay, 20, 30. Now you guys are getting old. Okay, but anyways, <laughs> some of us, it's just been something we've done since we were little bitties. Okay, we just go to church on Easter. Okay, because we're going to celebrate our Lord and Savior's resurrection from the dead. But that means more than just going to church one day a year or even every week of the year. The reality of the resurrection for us who believe in Christ, that's our hope. What if Christ never rose from the dead? I'd be home drinking coffee right now. <laughs> I mean, we, none of us would be here. There is no reason, okay? If he just died, what's the difference between any other religious leader that have, has ever lived? But the Old Testament said he would rise from the dead. While he lived... He said he would die and rise again from the dead. And that's how we would know. And he really did it. It's so cool to think about. So we have the Easter narrative. Okay, we all know the story. We're not going to walk through it together this morning. But you guys know that on that Friday, he hung on the cross. He died. Okay, they buried him. They put him in a tomb. They covered the tomb. And then Sunday morning happens. And women show up. I love you, sisters. Okay? It was the women that were there. They're the ones that discovered that Jesus wasn't there any longer. And they got word from an angel that he had risen from the dead. Great. Am I going to believe an angelic being, what they say? Isn't it cool that Jesus just didn't ascend right into heaven right away on the third day? He hung out for a little while. Okay? There were over 400 at one time that saw him. The disciples, even some doubted, got to see him and touch him. It's so cool to think about. 
He ministered. He got things set for the church. And I love it because resurrection is still happening. I want you guys to think back with me a little ways. We're not going to go back 2,000 years ago to the resurrection. Just one year ago, it felt like the church was dead globally. People didn't go to church a year ago. I was here and you guys were at home watching. A lot of us were in our tombs, per se. Can't do anything. But I love, here, we don't have a seat open this morning. This is kind of cool to think about. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Resurrection is still a reality. And we get to rejoice. We rejoice because he is not here. He's not in the tomb. He is risen. The tomb is empty, guys, because he lives. And it's so cool. 2,000 years later, here we are on an Easter Sunday. But what does it mean? I mean, that's the question. What does it mean for you, for me, okay? What does the Bible tell us? And that's where I want to go with you guys this morning together. So we know who Jesus is, okay? We read in Romans chapter 1, Jesus was declared the Son of God, okay? You guys understand, if you are a believer in Christ, you've been adopted into his family. When you're born into the Spirit, isn't it cool? You know, you cry out, Abba, Daddy. It becomes very natural. Before knowing Christ, that's a little weird. I'm going to call God the creator of all things, okay? My dad, I d that's wrong. That doesn't work. But the second you are adopted into his family, you become a child of his, a son or a daughter. You have relationship with him. He's your heavenly father. So when Jesus was asked, how do we pray, Lord? When you pray, say, our father. It's all about relationship. And it's so cool because it goes on to say in this verse, he was declared the son of God. Not just a son, but the son, the unique son of God with power. How? By the resurrection of the dead. So even in the truth of who he is, the resurrection is tied to him being the son of God. So very unique. And we saw God's approval. Do you guys know what he did on the cross as a perfect sacrifice <laughs> a blameless lamb. Do you guys know that the Father approved of that sacrifice? It took. All of our sins were paid for. So Christ's claims are all true. You guys know that he is the only way to eternal life. Do you know that? The only way. That's why everything flies today in the world. You can believe anything. We don't want to offend anybody. We need to be tolerant of everybody. But for some reason, when it comes to you born-again Christians, you're a bunch of crazies. You're narrow-minded. How can you say that Jesus is absolutely the only way? How can you be so narrow in your truth? Because we know the truth. We know that he is the way, the truth, and the life that no one gets to the Father except through him. And if you don't believe that, you're calling Jesus a liar. And that's not a good thing to do because Jesus is God and you're going to have to stand before your maker one day and that's going to stink. You're going to be wrong. But don't take my word for it. It's what he declared. Read his word. What did he say? And that's why the world is offended by Christ. That's why some of us get offended by what he says because we want our way. But you're not God. You don't get to set the ways. He does. I love this scripture. You can jot down John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus says here, I am the resurrection in life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this? Great. He said this to some guys 2,000 years ago. No, this is for you today also. Do you believe this? I don't care if you're here this morning because your spouse made you come or mom and dad, you know, are Christians and this is just what you do. We don't get in on anyone else's faith. God doesn't have grandchildren. Do you believe this? 
That's what he's asking you this morning. Either you do or you don't. You see, eternal life, too, I think about, <laughs> it's, it's beyond, you know, I think what we can grasp. Do you guys know if you are saved, if you've put your faith in Christ, eternal life has actually begun already? A lot of us think it's something that happens when we die. That's when eternal life begins. No, it's the second you repent and you put your faith in Christ. You are born again in the Spirit. You are eternally saved. Okay, Your citizenship is no longer here. The second you're saved, where is it? My home's now with Him. It's in heaven. My reality. Everything's become new for me. Everything's turned upside down. My allegiance is now to a good king. It used to be to a bad king named Satan. I was his child, but now I've been redeemed. I've been saved. I'm a son or a daughter of the king of kings. That's cool to think about. Some people think you can lose your salvation. I don't think so. Eternal life is eternal life. The second you believe, you have eternal life, period. But the question is, do you believe us? Do you believe? So, eternal life is a present reality. Are we living in that reality? We're told in Romans 6, verse 4, we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Isn't that cool to think about? We can have a new relationship with God. So many people who don't know him, they're walking around in fear. You know, have I blown it too bad? <laughs> Will he forgive me for these sins? Or am I doing enough good to please him? Have I given enough in this life to get in one day? And none of that stuff works, guys. He did the work. By faith, you are adopted into his family. He's your dad. My kids don't have to do anything to prove themselves to me. I just love them. They're my kids. They're in my family. They can be in my house just because they're my kids. Resurrection, life right now and here. Think about it, guys. We have this new relationship with God, okay? A life free from sin's domination and now a life of newness. Isn't that cool to think about? We're free from sin. We don't have to sin anymore. If you're not in Christ, you have to sin. You know, I dare you. If you don't believe in Christ, go try not to sin. See how long that, <laughs> that works. But we who have been set free, we have the Spirit of God. We can walk with Him in the Spirit. We don't have to sin anymore. You know, our flesh wants to, but man, we have the Spirit now living within us. You know, we can say, no, I ain't going to do that. I can choose to love instead of hate. Isn't that cool? Because when Jesus was on earth and He's asking us, like, hey, you guys <laughs> love one another. Really? Oh, I guess we can do that. I, I think that's a good idea. If everybody loved each other, hmm, things might be a little better here on earth, right? You know. But then he goes on to say, hey, I want you to love your enemies too. Whoa! 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 Wait a minute. You've lost it, Jesus. What do you mean, love my enemy? Is that even possible? I was in an argument one time over the resurrection of Jesus Christ with somebody. The facts are there. People are good at making excuses when they don't want to actually respond to their creator. They can have excuse after excuse. And we were talking about the greatest commandment, which is to love the Lord your God. And the second is like it, to love one another. As you love yourself, right? As we were talking and sharing with them, you know, they were, just, they were just getting frustrated, you know. And I tell, you know, I just told them, like, hey, I don't know your background. I don't know why you're struggling with this truth, you know. God loves you. 
and I love you. And he looks at me, you don't love me. I'm like, I do love you. That's why I'm taking time to have this conversation. I love you despite if I'm having this conversation or not. I'm able to love you because God has loved me. He's changed me. Well, you can't just love somebody you don't know. I'm like, well, I ask you a question. <laughs> Is there hatred in your heart right now towards me because I'm talking to you about true things? Are you a little mad because I'm talking to you about Jesus and letting you know that hell is a reality and that heaven's a reality and that God loves you and wants you to be with him in heaven, but your sin's going to send you to hell? You're hating on me right now, aren't you? Yeah. Well, you don't know me either. I'm, I'm a stranger. If you can choose to hate me, guess what? I can choose to love you. And the reason why I can choose to love you is because Jesus Christ lives with me and he is love. Do you guys understand when we come into relationship with Christ, everything turns upside down? Everything is new. The life in Christ, the newness of life, it's beautiful. There's another passage in Romans 6. Look at verse 10. It says, When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives... He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive through Christ Jesus. Isn't that cool? Think about that. How many of you guys like riddles? All right. I got one for you. Riddle me this. What is both dead and alive? The Christian. We are. Think about that. We are. We've died with Christ. It is no longer us who live, but we live in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Him who gave his life for us. In the life we live now, we live by faith in him. Right? Galatians 2.20. Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, pick up your cross. What? That speaks of death. You want me to die? Yeah. Yeah. Die to self. How many times were we told that over and over in Scripture? Well, isn't it about self-esteem? Doesn't God want me to feel good about myself? Hey, get saved and have Almighty God, creator of all things, be your dad. Yeah, you'll have plenty of self-esteem, okay? You're a child of the king. That's pretty darn cool. It's not about self-esteem. I mean, look it up. What does God say about self-esteem? I only found one Scripture, and it says, esteem others better than yourself. That's it. We're called over and over again in Scripture to die. We die to self. Hey, thanks, brother. You bet. How did you know? He's got the Spirit of God in him. <laughs> he knew I couldn't get through three pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're both dead and alive at the same time. So... The relationship for which you were made is a relationship with your creator, okay? All of us are looking for that. God has put something within all of us. He's written eternity in our heart. We know that we go on. But how do we go on? <laughs> Why do we go on? It's to have relationship with him. That's what it's all about. It's not about being a bunch of religious people. We've been created. And look at every person alive i have not met a person yet who doesn't worship something and people who haven't come to know the living god they are worshiping created things and they struggle in that they are left empty they have not found wholeness they haven't found the purpose in which they were created and they're settling for the lesser thing so we have new relationship. In light of this scripture, guys, we have new relationship to God, with God. We also have a new relationship to sin. We're going to go back a few verses to verse 5 in Romans 6. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know, we know this 
Underline that. We know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. Man, <laughs> we no long, we're no longer under the mastery of sin, guys. This is what the scriptures declare. Do you believe this? Are you in Christ? Do you live this reality? We are alive to God. And do you guys understand when we have right thinking about God, of Jesus, okay, it will allow us to have right living. That's why we need to be in the word of God. What do you say, God? Because your ways are right. They are higher. You are wiser. So right living comes out of right thinking. So when we look at a passage like this, do we agree? God, you're right. This is true. We are no longer under the power of sin. You don't understand how hard addiction is. Yeah, I do. Addiction stinks. Why is our nature so prone to sin? I don't know. It's just the way we are. But there is someone who can set us free. You guys know that? Do you believe that? If we believe the word of God, we're going to believe it. We're no longer under the power of sin. You guys understand that? You don't have to sin. You don't have to gossip anymore. You don't have to lust anymore. You don't have to. Debt, guilt, shame, condemnation, behavior, it's all broken. It's all been broken because of what Christ has done. There's a passage I appreciate out of First John, in chapter 2, he says this, My dear children, I am writing to you so that you may not sin. Okay, he took the time to write this letter, that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Isn't that cool? Because even we who are born again, we still sin. Okay? Yeah, God is doing a work in us. We are being sanctified and changing. But I haven't arrived. I feel like I could live a thousand lifetimes and still not be able to get there on my own. But he has set me free. And when I walk in the truth, man, there's a sweet fellowship with the Lord. I don't have to go there. I don't have to do that anymore. I get to enjoy you. And that fulfillment that I'm longing for, the reasons why I want to go there and do those things, they don't satisfy. You alone truly satisfy. You guys know what I'm talking about. Isn't that such a sweet spot to be with the Lord? I wish we could stay in that place every moment of every day. It's possible. God has so much grace and he gives us his spirit to do it. All we need to do is stay in that place of humility and just yielding and saying yes to him. And no to our fleshly desires. So I love that John laid that out for us. So we have a new relationship in light of these truths when it comes to our future. Okay? How many of you guys have kind of just settled in? Well, <clears throat> it is just what it is. I can't change. That's just what I'm like, and I'm always going to be like, and that's what the future holds. And I've seen some saints, some believers do that. They've just kind of gotten stubborn and settled in. You know, I came to faith in Christ. I began to read the word. I got in fellowship. I started growing, started to get it. And now I've just kind of plateaued. <laughs> and I'm okay with that until Jesus comes back. <laughs> um, no, we get to keep growing in him, guys. And we have a hope for the future. So our previous relationship to the future before Christ is one of fear. Okay. Death is a very scary thing for people. I look at this last year, a worldwide pandemic, you know? Yeah, it's worse than the flu. Yeah, more people are dying, and a lot of people are really tripping over the fear of death, okay? Yeah, there is wisdom in how we should handle a pandemic, but at the same time as believers, guys, what our future holds is different than what a lot of the world is struggling with, and that's why we see so much fear 
fighting and just chaos in light of everything going on because fear has gripped them. You know, nobody wants to get COVID. It stinks. If you don't think it stinks, talk to me afterwards. I had a horrible time with it. Um, <laughs> but on the flip side, guys, you know, hey, if I would die from something, that's kind of okay. Why? Because our future is pretty bright. I don't know about you guys. For the Christian, this life is the worst it's going to get for us. This is our hell. Okay? Anything after this life <laughs> is way, 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 way better. Okay? So don't be tripping about dying. Okay? And please don't trip when we have loved ones that die that are in Christ. Because our future is different. There is a hope. You know, we have loved ones that might be seeing Jesus soon. <laughs> That's hard. Hard on us. But the reality is anyone in Christ, they have a new relationship to the future. But those who are not in Christ, do you guys know that here's the best it's ever going to be for them? Hell's a very real place, guys. Jesus spoke of hell more than he did of heaven. He spoke the truth because he wants us to know that he doesn't want anybody to go there. It was created for Satan and the demons. <laughs> we were not intended to go there. But we chose to rebel. Okay? And even to this day, guys, we're still a rebellious people. You guys know that Gallup just took a new poll? Church attendance is the lowest it's been since, I don't know, how long was that, 150 years or something? It's just, and it's really declined. You guys want to guess in whose lifetime? Ours. It's, it's happening right before our eyes. We are turning our back on God. And we could talk about the reasons why, and there are many. Our government's blown in in our schools. We've chosen to lie to our children and tell them that there's no God. We kind of reap the consequences of that. But you know why they do that? It all boils down to pride. We're a prideful people, and we're willing to listen to the lies of the enemy. Instead of being humble and listening to the truth. That's all it is. I don't know about you guys, that's what gets me excited. Why does God ordained us, okay, this time in the future? I mean, we're 2,000 years out. Why has he chosen you to live now at this time in history? I believe he wants us to be world changers. We need to stop playing church. We need to stop going through the motions and actually start living in the reality of the resurrection of what the scriptures declare for you and I. So our previous relationship to the future before Christ, it was one of fear, right? Okay, fear of death, fear of how it's all going to end. Okay, heard yesterday, people are tripping. World War III is coming. Nukes out of Ukraine. You know, it's nothing. Guys, it'll be something next week in the news. Like, I'm just so sick of it. It's always something that we want to trip about. Don't let your hearts be troubled, guys. That's not how the world's going to end. We know how it's going to end. And if you don't know, you need to read the Bible, especially the end of it. <laughs> he lays it all out. Anyways, if Jesus has, through his resurrection, given us new and eternal life, then we don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear death. I want to share another scripture with you out of Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 14, because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die. And only by be or dying could he break the power of the devil who had made the power of death, or who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to fear of dying. So the fear was largely about judgment. Okay? And a lot of people don't even stand in that place today. They don't understand sin. They don't understand that there's going to be a judgment. Brother last week, uh, Bill, he's in the overflow out there, uh, gave me a little book by Ken Ham called Gospel Reset. Have any of you guys read it? Super short. Okay, but I so appreciated reading it this week because he went back to just a generation before. How many of you guys uh, actually got to see Billy Graham on television? Okay, or maybe even went to a crusade. 
How many of you guys got saved through Billy Graham's ministry? I know Kelly did, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But he was talking about that type of ministry, how what Billy Graham did. And you know what he did? He just got up and proclaimed the gospel. Okay? You guys are sinners. You need a savior. <laughs> you need to repent. That was his message. Very simple. And Ken writes in his book, Gospel Reset, how this next generation, that type of preaching doesn't work because we don't understand judgment, guys. We don't understand sin. We're not even teaching people what sin is any longer. We're teaching evolution that there is no God. There was no creator. It's all about you. It's all about naturalism. Survival of the fitness. Do what you can to get what you want in this life because it's all about you. So when you hear a preacher talking about sin and repenting and Jesus Christ dying on a cross and rising again, whoop de doo What does that mean? Because there's a generation now who doesn't even understand the reality of sin. And when you don't understand sin, you're not even going to think about judgment. I don't know how many people in recent years, and I've seen it in my own, I love sharing Jesus with people. I've been doing it for decades. But there's more and more conversations as I talk with people now. It's like, well, if there is a God, and he is a really a loving God, he's not going to send anybody to hell. That's what they think when it comes to judgment. No, you don't understand. There is a creator God, and he is holy. And in his holiness, he is just. <laughs> sin is a very serious thing. And we're living in a day and an age when we're calling sin good. And we're calling evil good. We're calling good, evil, sin. Anyways, um, we've missed largely um, a right fear when it comes to judgment. Another passage from the Apostle John in chapter 4 all who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love. And all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. You guys see that? But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in the world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So the question is, have you experienced his perfect love? Do you know him? I hope so. Because when you know him, perfect love casts out fear. You know? Because he lives, guys, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. He's alive. What do we have to fear? You know? Worst thing that could happen to me today? Hmm. I get to see Jesus face to face. Bummer. <laughs> Think about it, guys. All right, let's take another scripture here in 1 Thessalonians. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10 tells us this. Are you looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead? He is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. How many of you guys have been crying out, Maranatha? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I don't watch the news much, but when I do turn on the news, you know what it comes to mind? Come, Lord Jesus. Turning this off. <laughs> it's just like this world needs him to come. He needs to come. And you guys know he's going to set everything straight. He's going to set everything right. And I just can't wait to be home. It's going to be good. So the resurrection of Jesus, guys, means that we can be free from judgment and we can live eternally. That's the reality. That's the bottom line. Again, do you believe this? All right. Let's begin to wrap this up, Chad. <laughs> he was picking on pastors yesterday. We're hanging with a bunch of pastors, and he's just like, I love what pastors say in closing. And then a half an hour later, I'm like, I don't do that. It's only three pages of notes. I can't be lying too bad. <laughs> 
Uh, we just looked at Thessalonians. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians. There it is. Um, I love, if you guys ever are sharing with somebody and you're unsure where in the scriptures can I share the gospel clearly, turn to 1 Corinthians 15. It starts right in verse 1, but it begins to lay out the gospel beautifully. We're not going to go through it all right now. We're going to jump towards the end of the chapter in verse 53, where it says, For our dying bodies must be transformed to bodies that will never die. How many of you guys are looking forward to that? I feel like my body's dying. I'm like, I need a new one, Lord. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Think about that. Death's stinger has been removed. That's what's being declared here. Death is no longer an enemy of the Christian guys, okay? But it is an instrument of freedom. You guys know the more we die, the more freedom that we get to live in? I know it sounds backwards, but that's how it works with the Lord, and it is beautiful, okay? I don't have to sin any longer. I don't have to get drunk any longer. Isn't that cool? I love, I used to share with people at bars. I don't do it anymore because you guys might be like, hey, why is Pastor Landon going into the bar? <laughs> but when I was younger, especially overseas, that's where everybody hung out. So I'd go grab a Coke. I'd be sitting down with these people. And we had so many conversations like, hey, why aren't you drinking? I don't have to drink. Christ has set me free. I used to drink. I'm done drinking. How about you? Can you go a week without drinking? I didn't think so. If you come to Jesus Christ, put your faith in him, then you'll be able to. He can set you free. That's what our God does, guys. He sets us free. We have freedom in Christ. In the last part of this verse, I don't want to miss it because this is good too. For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power, but thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in him. It's not you sucking it up and I'm going to do really good and be a great person and not do those sinful things anymore. It doesn't work that way. It's Christ in you. He is our righteousness. So we will rise in glory is the point, guys. That's a beautiful thing. And all the effects of sin and death will be reversed. So fear... Um, fear about how it will be in the end. A lot of people fear that. One last scripture. I love this one. And you guys familiar with Isaiah 25? I didn't think so. So I totally stumbled upon this verse this week. And I'm like, this is so rad. I'm going to share it at Easter service. So what does it say? God will, in verse 7, remove the cloud of gloom the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. In that day, people will proclaim, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. And this is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Is that not a beautiful passage of scripture that Isaiah, where has it been this whole? It's right there. That's why we read the whole Bible. Him being our savior. It is all over the scriptures, guys. From Genesis to Revelation, it is all about what he has done for mankind. He is the savior of the world. He is mighty to save. You see, things are changing, guys. Because he lives. You have been changed because he lives. And we want to share him with the world, guys. That's our job. We get to live with him and we get to share him. We can't save anybody. He saves people. But people need to come to know him. So good news, the gospel. You guys know it's a fact? It's a fact. It's great news. And we get to share it. I encourage you guys, share well. Be light, be salt. So in closing, again, Chad, I want to ask all of you guys, not just Chad. 
What is your relationship with God? Great, we looked at some great scriptures today. Some really good truth laid out in regards to the resurrection, the gospel. But it comes down to what is your relationship with God? What is your relationship to sin and to the future? When you're in Christ, it all looks pretty good. If you're not in Christ, it's not good. Oh yeah, we deserve the not good. But God loves you, loves me. That's the game changer. And he didn't just say it. I love you guys. I'll forgive you. Then he wouldn't be a just God. No, he actually had to act on his words. He did something about it. No greater love than somebody laying down their life for a friend. And that's what Jesus Christ did for you. He loved you so much that he gave all of himself for you. He took our sin and death, the penalty of it all upon himself. That's what killed him, guys. Sin. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? (laughs) You guys know the Father, Son, and Spirit. Three are one, perfect harmony, unity for all time. And the first time there was any break of relationship, of that unity, of communion, was because of you. It was because of me. Our sin, guys. And he took that willingly because he loves us. He died. But it couldn't hold him. <laughs> he rose again. And because he rose again, guys, three things, and I hope you've caught this as we've gone through these scriptures this morning. You can have peace with God. Okay? Talked with thousands of people over the years. And that is the one thing that everyone is truly looking for. They want to have peace and peace with their maker. Even if they deny God deep down, they know. They know they're missing something. They know something's not right. They're looking for that peace And with the resurrection of Christ, we can have peace with God. We can have freedom from sin. That's pretty cool. Don't you guys think it's cool that our church name is Freedom Fellowship? Yeah, we didn't think too long on that. We just were meeting in freedom, so we called the church Freedom Fellowship back then. But it was a cool name, and it stuck because we do. It was for freedom's sake Christ came, right? 1 Corinthians 3.17. He came to set us free. But you can't receive that gift of freedom unless you receive it by faith. Some of you this morning might even understand what we're talking about. You get the gospel message, but you haven't received him, Jesus, by faith. That's your part. But once you do, you have peace with your maker. You have freedom from sin. And then we have joy for the future. Some of us are tripping. We had a lot of people this last year who lost everything. And when you're living for the things of this world, if you're serving mammon, the economy crashes and you lose your job, guess what? Your whole future collapses to the point people are taking their own lives because they don't have any hope. Man, it can all go away. It can all be taken away from us, brother and sister. We still have joy. We still have a hope that is sure. Because Jesus rose from the dead. So I want to encourage you guys to come to Jesus. Come to him. I can't save you. He is Savior. You can't save yourself. He alone is Savior. Well, how do I get saved, Pastor? I'm so glad you asked. The Bible says you need to repent. What does that mean? You turn to Christ. You put your faith in him and you receive the free gift of eternal life. You truly believe he died and rose again from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. Well, can it really be that easy? Don't I have to sign up for some church membership or something? It's just Jesus. Do you believe this? I sure hope so. Why don't we stand and we'll close in prayer together.
Well, Father in heaven, what a privilege to be able to gather together in this place at this time and to, uh, just to consider the good news, the gospel, all that you have done, Lord. And uh, it's, it's so beyond us, Lord, even before you created all of this, the heavens and the earth, uh, you knew that you'd have to be crucified. You knew that we would rebel, but still, <laughs> you love us. God, and you desire a relationship with us. What a privilege. God, we are very humbled by that truth and reality. God, and we want to pray, Lord, that we would live out that reality. Lord, um, pray that you would put into our hearts, Lord, just new songs, that we would find ourselves rejoicing uh, in you and all that you have done. We thank you that our future is sure in you. We're thankful that you're the one who holds the future, that we don't need to be tripping. God, there's a lot of problems out there in the world, and we know that you're the solution. God, we don't need to be tripping because <laughs> you're on the throne. And to be your kid, there's nothing like it. God, we want to see our loved ones bow the knee also, Lord. You've done everything. You've given your all uh, for them. Lord, we are grateful for that grace that has found us, but we know that grace can extend to all people, Lord. You died for the sins of the world. Lord, so would you please, God, use us, Lord, your church. May we be bold with the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be beacons of light in this world that is just so dark. Uh, people need you. I thank you for these brothers and sisters and those who've come today. God, just please uh, bless them. God, I know that you are, uh, you're the God who's uh, just got good things uh, set before us. God, you've given us a future and a hope, and uh, we need wisdom how to walk in that. So would you please, Lord, uh, help us to do that, to walk with you and be in step with your spirit. Father, thank you so much for this Easter Sunday, God, for the reality of the resurrection. We are truly grateful, Lord, that you so loved us. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen.